when you said from the from the get go that this job was the kind of your dream job is the right scenario. Uh, unfortunately for you, some rumors came out yesterday connecting you to the USC job. I just just want to give you the opportunity to refute it. So you can put yeah, it there's no there. chance that uh, I'm I'm here and committed to try to build an organization. <laughs> Ian, he loved that question. Yeah, I would say you could really see the joy in Urban Meyer's face when a reporter just giving him the opportunity to refute it. Very nice thing. Uh, he shot it down pretty good, saying no chance. And, and obviously, not a surprise. Urban Meyer is in literally game two. This is the second game he is about to coach as the head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Finally took the leap to the NFL after so many years of speculation. So many years of speculation. And People think now he's going to go to USC. But let me give you another reason, actually two more reasons, why this is highly, 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 highly unlikely. One, he probably could have had the USC job if he had wanted a year ago when there was all this Clay Helton speculation. My guess, educated guess, is had Urban Meyer said, yeah, I'd like that job, they may have, I don't know, hired him. Uh, that, would be, that would be one reason. The other reason is, uh, these jobs are, are generally filled early. Recruiting is important. There's early recruiting signing days now. Urban Meyer, theoretically, if he was going to take this job, which he is not, this would happen like in January. No way USC waits that long for any NFL coach. So, yeah, this is no. It's not great in Denver. No, not great, but I would say it could actually be worse. If you saw Jerry Judy go down a really ugly tackle, nothing illegal, but really ugly tackle uh, of Jerry Judy, it looked like his season may be over. Instead, it is four to six weeks on a high ankle sprain. Uh, I would say probably closer to six, but still four to six weeks for Jerry Judy. He went on IR yesterday, and he was not alone. Ronald Darby, one of their big ticket free agent items, corner, he suffered a hamstring injury, also placed on IR, which means Patrick Sertan, the first rounder, stud at corner, is going to make his first start. Obviously, that is a storyline we are going to enjoy watching and following. The Las Vegas Raiders, Gerald McCoy, uh, one of their older veterans, the defensive line, suffered a season-ending injury yesterday. If you watch McCoy, who missed all of last season, was trying for a comeback here with the Raiders. If you watch McCoy deal with this, you knew it was serious. It is, in fact, serious out for the season. Damian Square took his place on the roster. Yeah, Raheem Mostert, they're starting running back. You know, really flashes so well when he is healthy. Two, two carries yesterday, but 20 yards. I mean, electric for the 49ers, now out for the season. And this really is a fascinating one, Money, because the 49ers originally announced it was going to be eight games. Just a little trim of some cartilage, just clean up some things. But by the end of the day, Raheem Mostert announced himself on his Twitter account that he's actually going to undergo season-ending surgery. My understanding is it is going to be to repair the articular cartilage, which is kind of on the top of his knee, essentially provides a padding for his knee. It is a procedure that's been done by some other high-profile athletes. It almost always uh, gives players a 100% chance of full recovery. So Raheem Mostert, who is in the last year of his contract, going to be a free agent. We'll see if he's back with the 49ers. Going to be now fully healthy by the time he is a free agent and ready for the 2022 season. I think he's, he's, he's a young player who is uh, getting better every time he steps on the field. And that's in a lot of areas. That's you know, calling the play, you know, reading defenses, and his decision-making, his progressions. I think it's, it's, it's all getting better. All right, so let's bring in Cameron Wolf from Miami Gardens. And Mark Ross is back to also help provide analysis on what the Dolphins, Cam, are looking to do to take that next step on Sunday as they have another division game against the Bills. Yeah, it all starts with Tua, right? This is a really a measuring stick game for Tua and this Dolphins offense. This is the reigning champs coming into town. And... Let's be frank, 17 points isn't going to win it for most games, and I think the Dolphins know that. They want to be better offensively. There were some good things we saw, too. It was more aggressive down the field, and I really like their RPO game, particularly when they got it, the ball to Jalen Waddle, and they get a big boost this week with Will Fuller and his speed coming into the offense. So I just got out the practice field about 45 minutes ago, and I saw Fuller integrating with that new offense. I asked Brian Flores earlier this week about what impact Fuller's speed will have, and he said that those those guys, Fuller and Waddle, will make defenses have to play them honest. So I'm looking forward to seeing how the Bills' defense plays that speed of Waddle and Fuller. 
Well, Cam, you're 100% right. It all comes down to Tua. And what did Patriots corner J.C. Jackson say? That's what Tua do when he <laughs> says that he just looks at his first read and throws it there or he just chucks it up. And in watching the film, he's 100% right. Tua has to elevate this offense. He has to be comfortable and confident and able to if his search read is not there, scan the field and make good throws off of that, not just if his first read is not there, just throw it anyway or just throw it downfield and get bailed out, as he did a couple of times by Devontae Parker making some excellent catches down the field. So he has to elevate his level of play. As you, as you said, 17 points will not do it. You know, it's asking a lot of the defense to hold teams down and create turnovers every game. So Tua has to step it up and do more of what Tua do, not just what Tua do. <laughs> Yeah, and Cameron, look, it may not, it is asking a lot, but the defense in many metrics was not just one of the best, but the best in many categories in the league last year, what Brian Flores is doing with that group. What are they talking about when you have an offense led by Josh Allen and what they are looking to do to slow that unit down? Man, 56 to 26 is on their mind. That's the last time they played the Bills, and the Bills really put the smacking on them. And I talked to safety Eric Rowe earlier this week, and he mentioned that, look, it's not a revenge game, but we remember that. And I think it's a, a, a pride game for the Dolphins' defense. They want to be known as the elite bunch that we've seen for most of last season that we saw last week and not what they saw against the Bills. So I think one thing I'm really watching is how often they blitz Josh Allen. The Steelers last week didn't blitz Josh Allen much at all, and they had some success. And Allen has been a quarterback who's really picked apart the blitz when he had a chance. The Dolphins blitz a lot. Do they change their ways, or do they do what they do, as Mark was talking about with uh, J.C. Jackson? (laughs) (laughs) I I like it, Cam. And and as you mentioned, uh, the Steelers didn't have to blitz Josh Allen because they've got T.J. Watt and Cam Hayward. But the Dolphins don't have those sort of players. They get by more on scheme and and effort as opposed to just one guy or two guys being able to dominate. So it'll be interesting to see how they'll attack that. And looking at the Bills against the Steelers, they had their chances. They had a lot of holding penalties. They had a lot of drop balls. They had a missed uh, deep pass down the field to Emmanuel Sanders. And Josh Allen was just a little off. So I think they'll be back to the normal Bills that we saw uh, uh, all of last season uh, and not regress. So this could be a difficult game for the Dolphins if they're not able to kind of play honest with with rushing Josh Allen with four because, uh, as we know, he can break out and make plays on the move as well, which could be very difficult for them to defend. Heidek is going deep, looking for McLaurin. That one is caught by McLaurin out of bounds. Did they say he got his legs in? At the 10-yard line. Unbelievable catch by McLaurin. Good ball, there it is. Man, that was the hardest catch of my life. That was like over my head on the left. Senora Sequence, the premier predictive analytics expert in all the land. Cynthia Freeland comes along to help you, the people at home, figure out, I don't know, what you're going to do, what you might do Thursday or what you might do on Sundays. Uh, So, Cynthia, let's get started. What jumps out? What leapt from your model uh, that you want to share with us? here today well my my new my new it thing oh my goodness that was so crazy um i loved my new little intro thing that was awesome anyways uh, what i saw and you saw up close and personal was we didn't see washington get a ton of pressure against the chargers last week in fact they only got pressured on the 16.3 percent of dropbacks that's like half of what they did last season last season they ranked number seven almost 32 percent pressure rate that's all per next gen stats so the interesting part here is are we going to see that happen because You know, Daniel Jones was pressured on 42.5% of dropbacks since the start of the 2020 season. That's the highest rate in the NFL. That's a ridiculous rate. Just for some context, think of 25% as like a lot. So that's like 20% more than a lot. Yeah, I'll tell you what. uh, And we talked about it last week, Cynthia. Uh, You mentioned I was there. I called games for the Chargers. What Rashawn Slater did to Chase Young, they they moved him. They ended up moving Chase Young to the other side because Slater was dominating him one-on-one, and we'll see whether or not Andrew Thomas can do that. And that's what you're looking at is clean versus muddy pockets for Daniel Jones and how he operates in each. Yeah, it's significantly different. And the interesting part here is if you look at his completion percentage, 53.6% completion percentage with 11 touchdowns and 11 picks, in his career when he's under pressure, by the way, just for context, when he's not under pressure, it goes up to almost 67% with 25 touchdowns and the same number of interceptions. So the interesting thing for me here is 
how are they going to use Saquon Barkley if he is available for them to play is going to be absolutely key. If he does play, and he's questionable right now, the projection is 71 rush yards, three receptions, and 21 receiving yards. So it's a big day in terms of total numbers, but the real effect is that Daniel Jones will have a much better opportunity to complete passes if Saquon's there. All right, so Saquon numbers, but I think the numbers everybody wants to know is what do you got uh, as far as this game goes? Who wins? What's the score? So I have the Washington football team taking this one 23 to 17. Antonio Gibson is a big factor in this one for me. Obviously, lots of question marks with what's going on with the quarterback going on IR with Ryan Fitzpatrick. So for me, Antonio Gibson's projection of 80 rush yards, a touchdown, three receptions, and 19 yards reflects the fact that this guy was a wide receiver, transitioned to running back. He's been a big, shining, bright star for this offense, and they will center it around him and Terry McLaurin. It's new right now. And we go to the Browns' social media feed, and that is official Kevin Stefanski pointing out that Odell Beckham Jr. still working his way back from last year's season-ending knee injury, and he will not play is what the word is uh, out of Cleveland. So let's bring in the aforementioned intrepid insider Ian Rappaport. What can you tell us about what's happening in Cleveland with Odell Beckham Jr., Ian? Yeah, just not quite ready for this week. Odell Beckham Jr., actually, there was optimism inside the organization that Odell Beckham Jr., would play last week. All they wanted him to do was warm up pregame. They watched him extremely closely, thought he was going to go, just wanted to make sure he felt 100% comfortable and ready. And right around the time the team needed to hand in their card saying who is active and who is inactive, they made the decision. Odell Beckham Jr. just not quite ready. And it sounds like he didn't feel completely comfortable either, perhaps because he didn't really have contact during training camp. Either way, he was not quite ready to play. So he did not play last week, was described to me as a very close call. And just to take it out of his hands, make sure he's absolutely 100% ready when it's time to take the field. They declared early this time that he is not going to play this week. Perhaps in week three, we will see Odell. Yeah, and they will take on the Texans this week, a team that really put it on the Jacksonville Jaguars this week. Their head coach, Urban Meyer, taking in coming for that performance by his team. But Kim Jones, Kim, you were there. You saw it. We thought it was going to be the battle, that defensive line of Washington versus the offensive line of the Chargers, and it was really a one-sided affair in favor of the Chargers. What are they saying about their defense going into this Thursday nighter? It certainly was one-sided. Justin Herbert started a season as hot as a firecracker. He was absolutely terrific, and that, of course, came at the detriment to the Washington football team defense. I talked to Jonathan Allen from that defense yesterday, and I asked him particularly about Chase Young, and he said that the Chargers were doing everything to disrupt Chase. They were chipping him. They were sending a slot receiver towards him to increase the traffic around him, and that Herbert was at times getting rid of the ball in 1.5 1.5 seconds. I have to believe Daniel Jones has taken note of that. But I also sensed from Allen a deep resolve for this pass rush for the Washington football team to put a much better foot forward on Thursday against the New York Giants. Listen, that's not who this team is, and it's not who this team can possibly be and flourish. And as Ron Rivera said this week, I expect it to be fixed. Well, the, uh, the Chargers offensive line stepped up to the challenge. How about the Giants offensive line? Much embattled offensive line over the last couple of years. Yep. What do you make of what they got ready for Washington? Yep. Unofficially, a million question marks about the New York Giants offensive line over the past several years. And even this preseason, there have been questions. And Matt, they, they held up very well against the Denver Broncos. Uh, Von Miller played, Bradley Chubb did not. Listen, that's not the Giants' fault. They have to play who's it before them. And I think they realize that Thursday, they are going to have a much more for- formidable task before them because the Washington pass rush is healthy. However, I do think when it comes to confidence, a lot of this game is here up, right? Andrew Thomas played very well, graded out very well from that game. He's the Giants' left tackle. He probably needed that, and that's a good sign for the Giants as they embark on not only tomorrow's game, but, of course, this whole season, needing that O-line to allow Daniel Jones and, of course, Saquon to operate. Yeah, no doubt, and uh, doing it against a heck of a defensive front with Denver there, led by Von Miller. Thank you, Kim. Kim from Landover getting ready for that Thursday Night Football, and we stay in the NFC East as Dak 
dominated, distributed 400 plus passing yards, three touchdowns, but Tom Brady would not be denied in the season over. Now Dallas looking to deal with the aforementioned Chargers offensive line, that defense and avoiding starting the season at zero and two. See the team throwing the ball 50 plus times, you go, I know I do from an offensive perspective. You, it's, oh my God, my, you know, the tackles are on their heels the whole game, or, you know, the, the, the line is on their heels the whole game. But if, you know, 15 of those are RPOs, that's not necessarily true. So I, I think that's, um, when we talk about balance, that's what we're talking to. We're not just talking about this many runs or this many passes.